a fictitious name and date of birth. What is your full name and age? James Arthur Hub, 31. Under what name did you make the application at Princeton University? I made it under Alexi Santana. Where did you uh, obtain that name? I made that name up. For what purpose? Um, because I wanted to uh, start all over again without any burdens of my past. The 31-year-old parole violator who changed his name, wrote himself an exotic resume, and gained admission to Princeton University was arraigned today on a number of charges, including theft. We've been fooled, certainly. Five years before he conned his way into Princeton University, James Hogue pulled a similar scam at my high school in Palo Alto, California. He told us his name was Jay Huntsman and that he'd grown up on a commune in Nevada, and we believed him. Since that time, Hogue's story has always intrigued me. Three years ago, I set out to investigate the life of this compulsive con artist, by retracing his steps and trying to find the real Jim Hogue behind the many masks he wore. Back in 1985, uh, at approximate age of 25 years, you entered uh, Palo Alto High School and purported to be a 16, 17-year-old youth. Do you remember the name that you assumed at that time? Jay Huntsman. Did you engage in any athletic mm -hmm. activities while you were at that high school? I ran with the high school team. The first time I saw him was in a race in 1986, I believe it's October of 1986, a Stanford Invitational Cross Country Meet, which is like the biggest cross country high school meet in the country. And um, he ran in that race and won it, and it created quite a stir. He basically came out of nowhere. I mean, he had shown up at the school, I think, a month before that, uh, right at the beginning of the school year in September. and. Uh, and came in with a very odd story, telling people that he had grown up on a commune in Nevada, that his parents had died in Bolivia, that he was of Swedish background. I think he intrigued and enthralled everybody at the high school um, with his manner, with his talent. I don't remember him talking very much about his background. He seemed like a bit of a loner. He didn't just blend into the pack. It wasn't that he was a little bit better. He was quite a bit better. We all thought he was so phenomenal, but he didn't seem to want the limelight. He wasn't one of those people who was like running over to talk to the reporters after winning a race. It wasn't his style. There was such great mystery to him. So I start checking out the facts. And the obvious intrigue for me was I was calling a, a county recorder down in San Diego and saying, hey, you know, do you have a, a birth certificate on this guy, Jay Huntsman? And they looked it up and they said, well, yeah, we, we do. So I said, look, is there anything different about this birth certificate? Is there anything you know, strange you know, that you can, you can tell me about this? And they said, well, yeah, it says he's dead. At first, he was a normal, healthy baby, but just two days later, he succumbed to pneumonia. It was a little startling to find out that somebody could actually dig into records and utilize records that uh, should be fairly private. To this day, I'd still like to ask him, how did you go about picking our son's name? How did you go about using this birth certificate? Can you give a little bit of background on who Jay Huntsman was? I don't know who he was. It was just some uh, name I found in a newspaper. It was about the age that I wanted to be, so I used that. Was he a deceased person? Yes.
it was pretty unbelievable that someone could lie that much and that well to so many people. I mean, he essentially lied to every single person around him. The only person I really wanted to talk to about it was him, because I felt like looking him straight in the eye and going, who are you? Why did you do this? And I never got that opportunity because he was gone. I always had in the back of my mind that he would do it again, that I would literally run into him again as someone else. What happened after you were suspended from the high school? I stayed in Palo Alto until probably June of the next year. Were you arrested in the state of California? Yes. How was the charge? Uh, forgery. I spent about two months in jail for that. But where did you go after California? Then I went to Utah. So did you bring anything with you from uh, California to Utah? Yes, I brought some uh, um, bicycle parts. 1987, I was a detective for the St. George Police Department, and I received some information uh, about some stolen property out of the state of California. One of my confidential informants told me that he knew of a storage shed where there were several bicycle frames that were property from a burglary in uh, Southern California. We served the search warrant. The storage unit was locked. We cut the lock off. When I raised the door, I recognized immediately the bicycle frames that were uh, listed in my affidavit for the search warrant. It appeared to me that um, the suspect in question, James Hogue, was living out of the storage shed. I found uh, several things that were not listed on the search warrant. The first place trophy with the name Alexi Santana on it which I found out later was an AKA and also known alias that uh, James Hogue was using. He had run in races, putting himself off as a 16-year-old, and at this time he was in his 20s. I also found some what appeared to be uh, admittance uh, and referral sheets from uh, some Ivy League schools. Um, I don't recall the schools uh, exactly, but I do remember that uh, the name Alexi Santana was on some of the, uh, the applications. I don't remember how long we were there serving the search warrant on the storage shed when James Hogue arrived. I was able to identify him and at the time uh, placed him under arrest on a second degree felony receiving stolen property. He finally admitted to uh, being involved in the burglary in California and pled guilty through a plea bargain agreement you were sent to state prison in Utah. Right. For how long? Uh, for, I think I was in there for six months. Had you already made application to Princeton University as a student? Yes. to the admission office, Princeton University. I have been living independently here in the Mojave Desert since 1985, while my mother currently resides in Switzerland. Even though my formal education is lacking, I do not consider myself to be disadvantaged for that reason, and I'm requesting to be considered as a serious applicant for admission to Princeton University. Sincerely, Alexei Santana. What we saw in Alexei Indris Santana's application was a very bright, imaginative young man who appeared to have a hunger for learning and who had faced a number of circumstances that kids don't commonly face. From the experience on the ranch to his travels in Europe to the books that he'd read um, to his way of describing the books, these were all indicative um, of a kid who um, didn't simply take schooling at, at face value, but was actually um, motivated to learn. 
To the admissions board, this is a letter in support of Alexi Santana's application to your school. Alexi worked for me as a livestock tender last summer. Among the qualities needed to do this job are creativity, calmness, toughness, and self-sufficiency. I have the feeling that Alexi is probably one of those geniuses. At least he is unusual. I recommend him without qualification because he deserves it. Sincerely, George China, Lazy Tea Ranch, Park City, Utah. Listen to my tale, man, it's really sad I got those tiger towns. He was a kid who worked on a ranch and slept in a sleeping bag just out in the fields and herded sheep and cattle. And he'd been self-educated in a commune in California and was now interested in coming to college. And he was a fast runner and the coaches were interested. Santana had sent articles from Utah newspapers that said he'd run 859, I think, on a cinder track for 3,200 meters, which is exceptional, you know? Just fast enough so he didn't break the national record, but fast enough so a coach would go, whoa, fly this kid out. So I said, like, damn, I just can't get over this guy. Uh, you know, the best distance runner that I ever recruited because the times that he had attained were better than anyone else coming in from high school. That just uh, sort of pepped me up to really get into recruiting him more heavily. Well, I've been told by the coaches, Santana's coming out here, and I want you to go out running with him every day, and I want you to run as hard as you possibly can every day the entire time he's here. And I want you to come back on that Monday or whenever you left and report to me and tell me what you think. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't drop him. I couldn't even really tire him out for the most part. And so, of course, you know, I came back and said, you know, guys, for real, he can really run. He'd been admitted and deferred. And the story of the reason he had deferred was because his mother was dying of leukemia in Switzerland, and he wanted to go be with her. And in fact, I think the coach here paid for his plane fare to go to Switzerland to be with his dying mother. Students, they come from every social group, every religion, from high schools and prep schools. Princeton doesn't try to press them into a common mold, but rather encourages them to develop as individuals. It offers them all the same opportunity to learn and to develop the ability to give what they know to their own community. They have been selected carefully for the promise of such giving. It was the Cinderella story. Uh, Alexia and her Santana never even went to high school, had a really tough time uh, growing up, and yet uh, brilliant, brilliant guy. Princeton kind of takes him in, fully picked up the tab for everything, and nurtured him into the brilliant phenom that he was, but the fact is he was already brilliant. His father had been killed in a car crash, and his mother had just died of leukemia. He had been a ski instructor, done stunts for movies. He was a bicycle racer and a track athlete. Everybody knew his story. Every coach, every teacher, uh, every professor, everybody knew him because he was so exceptional. He was self-taught, just read books while he was a shepherd. And he, uh, he took care of his mom and then uh, decided that he wanted to go and learn more, and so came to Princeton. Uh, the rumor was that he was taking somewhere between six and seven courses, where the usual uh, load would be somewhere between four and five, and he was acing every single one of them. There was an aura about Alexi, a kind of like, this guy's a genius, this, this guy's amazing. What type of courses do you take? I take, uh courses in science, uh, math, liberal arts. How is uh, 
the academic situation pertaining to you at Princeton University. How are your grades? Um, I get A's and B's. He would answer any question in the minimum number of words necessary. And then there would be the silence. He always wore a hat, mostly to cover his eyes and his hair, because he was balding. He always looked at the ground, and he shuffled. And he would uh, talk very quietly, often sort of stuttering. And he would, uh, he'd spend a lot of time moving his feet and sort of mumbling a little bit and kind of grinning and, you know, real shy. It was rare that he would look you in the eye. Very rare. He seemed to undergo a transformation the second year. When he showed up, he had long, stringy hair, and he was always wearing sneakers and jeans. And then he'd cut his hair. He looked very clean cut. He was now wearing khakis and button downs. And he'd become a member of what's the most prestigious eating club at Princeton. I think he just wanted what a lot of Princeton students or Harvard students or Yale students that kind of come out of middle of nowhere America that see that as a prestigious way out. You know, you just keep knocking off those that next prestigious rung, whatever it is. You know, you come to Princeton and you get into the prestigious eating club and you go and you get your graduate degree or you go to, you know, Wall Street and then you got it made. And for him, the next step, I really think, probably was the Rhodes Scholarship. How long have you been associated with the Prince University track team and, and what capacity? Um, since I came to Princeton, I practiced and competed with the team. And uh, what are your specialties in track? <clears throat> Um, I do long distance races. I walked into this big indoor stadium and saw him running for Princeton. I mean, I recognized him immediately. There was no doubt in my mind that it was him, and I was just completely shocked. He hadn't aged. He looked like the same person that I'd gone to high school with five years later, running for Princeton. I mean, I just knew that he'd done it again. And I also remember thinking, well, what do I do? I thought that if I walked up to the Princeton coach, he would think I was crazy. I mean, what a, what a crazy story to walk up to a coach and say, I know one of your athletes, and he's not who he says he is, and he did the same thing when I was in high school, and now he's done it to you big time. So I found the Princeton team where they were all sort of sitting, and I walked up to them and I said, what is his name? What is that guy's name? There were about eight of us in a geology class in a lab and two two men in suits came up and they consulted with a professor and then all of a sudden uh, the professor said Alexander Santana uh, these gentlemen want to have a word with you they were reading him his rights literally two feet from the open door he was standing in the doorway we saw the cuffs go on and we said holy shit what's going on you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can be used against you in a court of law. Do you understand these rights as they have been read to you? Yes. We called him out of the class, uh, asked him what his name was, and he said, James Hogue. Then he was brought into headquarters, read his rights, uh, and then interviewed. And then he gave me a full statement indicating exactly what he did. When you uh, enrolled at Princeton University under the name of Alexei uh, Santana, what date of birth did you use? I told them I was born um, January 1st, I mean January 7th, uh, 1969. 
What is your actual date of birth? Uh, October 22nd, 1959. I thought it would help me get into the school if I were you know, 10 years younger than I actually was. What is your ultimate Which goal? Was. What do you expect out of Princeton University? Um, well, I don't expect anything now. Prior to having been arrested? Um, I expected to uh, get a degree. That guy's a genius. I just thought it was unbelievable. Just absolutely unbelievable. I mean, I've spent a lot of time with him. A lot of real close personal time. I mean, when you're out in the middle of nowhere running for hours, that's when, you know, most guys really, track team type guys will really bond, you know. Talk about friends, families, problems, concerns, goals, dreams, all sorts of stuff like that. And I spent a lot of time running with him, and I really had no clue no idea how complex his uh, web of deception was. He must have believed who he was. He probably convinced himself that, you know, this is me, Alexi Santana, and he actually believed he was living this, this life, so to speak. It makes sense that he didn't want to have anything to do with me. It makes sense that he didn't want to talk to us about you know, anything. It makes sense that his stories didn't quite match up. It made sense that he cracked the curve in, uh, in his science class because he'd actually done three years of engineering and science. It made sense that he went running, you know, was this fantastic runner. He'd been running seriously for years. It made sense that he was pale when he showed up at Princeton because he'd just come out of jail. Who cares, you know, where he came from in the past, but he was making the most out of his education. He was, he was doing more than 90% of the people at Princeton do in terms of really getting a lot out of his education. You know, why don't you just reprimand him and leave him alone? It seems appropriate that this drama is, was set on a university campus because whenever anyone goes to college they have a chance to invent themselves again. I remember not feeling at all bad that he'd been caught or that sort of who he was had been exposed or even really that he was in jail. It wasn't until I spoke to someone later on who had um, also had experiences with him earlier in his life and he sort of chuckled and said well he'll get what's coming to him you know what happens to people in jail then i felt bad can you explain why you have done this twice you have uh purported to be someone you're not because i wanted to uh start all over again um without any burdens of my past maybe a good place to start would be where in fact you did graduate from high school Wyandotte County is where we grew up. In the state of Kansas, it's renowned as the poorest county in the state. My father uh, and his father both worked for the railroad. All of our parents were hardworking, blue-collar people, by and large. And their philosophy was they wanted their kids to, to, to get out of that, to be bigger, to be better. You hear uh, the rich folks saying, oh, it's equal opportunity, everything is good, no problems. Times have changed. Well, that's just not true. It's just not true, you know, and they can say it and they can believe it. They can say we all got the same chance, but I'm telling you, the kids in the neighborhood from Kansas City, Kansas, where I'm from, they don't have the same chance as somebody that grows up in, in, in a nicer neighborhood. They absolutely don't. So that's why I'm amused that he pulled the wool over Princeton. I wouldn't be so amused if he pulled it over northern Iowa. Because, you know, here in the Midwest, you're supposed to get the wool pulled over your eyes, you know. But not Harvard, not Princeton, not the Ivy League. We started hanging out when I was a sophomore, and Jim was a junior.
every single day, you know, Jim would run. We would put on our tennis shoes, boom, he would take off and he would run. And I would do my very best to keep him in sight. When Jim was in the ninth grade, no one could touch him. He would win virtually every meet. I mean, it was, no one could really even believe that there was a kid that could run like that. You know, people would come to watch him run. We've never had a uh, student that's run that fast. His name's on the on the, on the record boards as you know the best modern two modern that Washington High School's ever had. And he could have been a national champion. You know, he had that kind of ability. I really thought that Jim had the potential to run the world's record in the mile to run the world's record in the half mile. He had the talent. He also had the mental makeup to do anything. He was very intelligent, and uh, his mind was always working. He had ways that he felt that things should be done. Jim was definitely an individual. In running, he was the best. He always finished first. But one of the things Jim always said is, you have to be different. And if he couldn't finish first, he would finish last. The jingle bells that you'd see on packages, he would wear those on his shoes. He wore his hair long during the track season, and then one day he would show up and he'd have a crew cut. And it was just constantly, don't get comfortable with Jim because he's going to change it. He was adamant, too, about wanting to go to college. I could just start listing every college that had a track program, and I bet they wrote him. And he knew he was going somewhere where if they didn't have mountains, you could see them. That was important to him. And he chose Wyoming for that reason. Coach, last year, last in the conference, this year you come in third in the nation. What's the difference? Well, we had a very good recruiting year. And, of course, this is only my second season at the University of Wyoming. And so we went out and recruited very well this, this summer, and that's the difference. Wyoming had, at that time, some pretty good athletes that were on the Kenyan Olympic team. They were excellent runners, but he wasn't the least bit intimidated by them. He was in that class. Here we were, this group of highly accomplished U.S. athletes, and these Kenyan athletes showed up that first day, some who had been in the Olympics before, many who would go on to win national titles. All of a sudden, it was redefined who the best athletes on the team were. There was a lot of discussion amongst the team about how it was kind of patently unfair that the Kenyan athletes who were much older than us, you know, 28 years old when they were freshmen. And now the NCAA has passed law, uh, rules against that, so you can't be that old and compete. But at that time, it was, it was not un uncommon. It was a bit of a love-hate relationship. It's great to have the foreign athletes on the team because the team did so well. But at the same time, he was that year the fifth best runner on the team, not the best. Kilili of Wyoming, a pre-race favorite, continued to increase his lead as the rest of the pack was strung out further and further along the course. What about the individual runners on your team? Did they perform about as well as you expected? Uh, down the line, our fifth man was back much further than I expected him to be. He slipped a little bit today, too. He was a runner, first and foremost. That was his identity. be a distance runner, you have to be a con man and a liar to yourself. You have to convince yourself that you're not hurting when you know you're hurting, and you have to con yourself into running five more miles when you want to quit right now. The way he reacted to it was to begin to train very 
hard and very diligently. So what he was trying to do was, and you could see it, he went through some extreme workouts in order to try to compete at that level. Jim did not want anyone to know his weaknesses ever. Never once did I hear him tell me that he thought he was outmatched in college, that he couldn't compete at that level. I'm sure he thought he was the best there was, that he was capable of anything. So maybe he went back to, to college to show that, you know, I, you know, I could have, should have, and kind of relive the glory days of running again. To go back and have people say, hey, man, look at that guy. He's a good runner. He's special. He's gifted. He's different. Nobody else ran the times that Jim ran when he was on the track at Princeton. He was, Jim Hogue ran those times. Jim Hogue beat those boys on the track. Hey, Jim took all, all the entrance exams. He didn't send someone else in the room to take those exams. He took the exams. He did all the classwork. He got all the accolades in school. He got the offers to be one of the boys in the club there too. And that was Jim Hogue. And why he picked Princeton? I don't know. You decide. He'll tell you. In his applications to Princeton University, he claimed to be Alexei Indris Santana. He indicated in his application that he had never attended school after the year of 1979 that his mother, a sculptress by the name of Susan Vendriska, lived in Switzerland, that his father, a potter named Oscar Carlos Santana, was deceased. He claimed to have been born in California and asserted that he was self-educated. In fact, Your Honor, Mr. Hogue graduated from Washington High School. What he did was a violation of the law, lying as part of your application to Princeton is not acceptable, ever. Big lie, small lie, it's not okay. Princeton was adamant. They wanted him out. They got duped, they got conned, they got taken, and they didn't like it. The only course of action from the standpoint of the institution um, since this young man had applied to Princeton under utterly false pretenses um, was to declare the admission null and void. And from Princeton's standpoint, the fact that his admission was declared null and void means that he was never a student there. I spoke to some of his professors, and they were all incredibly supportive of him. I mean, he, he was a good student. He really wanted to graduate from Princeton University. I just got the sense that this was the life that he wanted to have, or this was the life that he dreamed of. I always thought, if that's what he wanted to do, the dumbest thing he, he could have done was to run track. When you're good in something, somebody's going to find out. But he, I, I think he probably loved to run. And uh, he couldn't stop himself. We have an individual who has absolutely no ties to our community. We also have an individual who has demonstrated a propensity to deny and conceal his past. The only ties he had were as a student at Princeton University. Of course, those ties are now severed. I couldn't conceive of the judge giving him any time. That was a miscalculation on my part.
My father and I were involved in a fencing operation. We'd buy stolen property and resell it. And I was convicted and I, I got sentenced and I went to the Mercer County uh, Correctional Center and that's where I met Jim Hoag. When I first saw Jim, it was surprising that somebody from Princeton would be in a jail like that, you know. And as smart as he was, he didn't have any problems with any inmates. I and mean, he, he kept to himself. It looked like he was in his own little world. It wasn't like he was even in jail. He was just doing his time in, in another world. He'd be on the top bunk, and he'd put the, um, a blanket over his head, and he'd just be reading. And that's probably the, the, what he would do most of the day. Here's um, some of the books Jim used to read. It's an engineering book. What, whatever that is. Geophysical inverse theory. Uh, if you know what that is, let me know. Life and moving fluids, quantum field theory. Some good reading here. Jim used to talk about this. Um, mineral lands and mining about staking a claim in Colorado for um, some property, and he was gonna build a little cabin there. Jim, he brought him around, I don't, where'd you bring him from? Uh, from jail. From jail. He'd come around, I don't know, he'd come out of nowhere. He was okay, though. He was good with us, he wouldn't con us, we'd break his legs. So he was no dummy, yeah. he, he was smart. He got over on them out of Princeton. They didn't like that at all. Made them look like jerks there. They, they know everything out there, them blue bloods. There it is, Princeton University. It's lonely at the top. He was a man of Princeton. There was something different about it. I couldn't pinpoint him. I usually can pinpoint everything from with everybody, but he was different. I couldn't make him out. I never understood him. I just never understood it. I mean, I understood what he did. I didn't understand why he did it. I mean, he was such a smart person. He could have got a degree anywhere. My picture of Jim has always been this lonely person who might be living on top of a mountain somewhere reading books. But I don't know if that's him. I had spent nearly a year and a half investigating Hogue and reached a dead end. The strange course of his life was no longer a mystery to me, but one piece of the puzzle was still missing. Hogue had always refused to speak publicly about his deceptions and had disappeared after leaving prison in 1997. I wonder when he does these things if he knows by now how they always end. Uh, or I wonder if the fact that you don't know where he is today, and I don't know where he is today, it means maybe, maybe, it doesn't always end the same way for him. A, he's changed, or B, he's gotten much better at it. I've spoken with his mother, and she apparently doesn't know where he is. Hogue's mother, who still lives in Kansas City, refused to speak with me. Even Hogue's sister, who declined to appear on camera, had no idea where he was. I actually haven't spoke to him in probably seven or eight years. Do you know where my brother is now? Jason Cole, the reporter from Palo Alto, even suspected that I was Hogue. You really are James Hogue. Why are you doing this? My heart is racing, being just in the same room with you. I don't know if this is your way of you know, getting revenge. It's a good way to do it. Cole had desperately wanted to speak with the real Hogue, and so did I. After leaving prison, Hogue had continued to use his real name, and I was able to trace him to this apartment complex in Aspen, Colorado. Hey, I'm sorry to bother you. I was looking for uh, someone named Jim Hogue. Does he live here? No. Or... Hmm. 
High in the hills above Aspen, I met a woman who had rented a room to Hogue, but she refused to appear on camera. He is sick. He's basically, basically very sick and very vengeful. I don't even want to be have my name associated with him. He's that bad. Later that day, I got a message from Hoke's friend, Sarah Avery. Hello, Jesse. Um, you've called me trying to get a hold of Jim Hogue about a week ago. I'm calling to find out if you can give me any information about what you were trying to reach him about. She gave my number to Hogue, and Hogue called me. You, you made quite an effort, I guess. You showed up in Aspen anyway. That's, that must have been quite a... Quite an ordeal. I guess I've had probably plenty of opportunities to tell the story. I don't know what it is you wanted me to do exactly. Well, I'd like to uh, to come out there and um, you know meet with you. A few months later, Hogue agreed to travel with me to the land he owns in southern Colorado, but asked that I not reveal its exact location. It was the first time he had agreed to appear on camera. Hogue is still a drifter. He moves from town to town and does construction work to earn a living. He keeps his possessions in a storage shed. for 20 miles almost. Yeah, that's pretty quiet. Well, originally I thought I might put up a little shack here and stay a few weeks a year or something. I don't know that very many people are completely satisfied with their position. So people invent things about themselves all the time. Uh, and I don't think that's any mystery at all. What you think you know is not what is real. I think the people want known what they want to have known. They're not ever going to be able to reveal everything about themselves. It doesn't matter how many masks you have because there is something stable that's really you. And you are the only one who knows that. That is the only reality that's true is what you have inside of yourself. If I were a drug addict or whatever, there would have been a million psychiatrists or whatever. You know, or if I were an alcoholic, there would have been endless, tedious, you know, AA meetings or whatever. But but what? But what? But, but there's not. You know, because this is a different form of addiction, I guess, you know, whatever. This is not a recognized <laughs> It's not a recognized what? It's not recognized as being deserving of whatever. You know, they think drug addictions are deserving of, you know, having a remedy for. What is it? The way I behave. 
you know. <laughs> Having a different moral standard or different moral action than what's recognized as the correct one. A year after our first meeting, Hogue agreed to return to the Princeton campus. He has been declared officially unwelcome and was concerned about being recognized. It was like being in a play. I was a character. The character, his name was Alexi Santana. I thought that the way that I played my role caused other people to play their role in a certain way. They uh, fell into the little psychological traps that I created. It's all smoke and shadows. You want to uh, create a psychological buffer between your real self and the character that you're doing and you want to create a mood to make that character believable. He would allow you to create him. He didn't want to create his own personality, he wanted you to create it for him. And as a result, um, you know, he allowed people to project on him what they wanted. More than anything, that was really his brilliance. I never felt betrayed. It was more kind of fascination, like this guy is so much smarter than I am, that he must have just been living in fear and you just realize, you know, he was in a play, 